it's Mayor from Chat with Data. So let's imagine you have two documents, right? These could be two PDFs. In this case, I'm looking at Lyft SEC 10K, uh, a ton of text, uh, structured data in terms of tables, and it's very long. It's hundreds of pages of PDFs. And I've also got Uber as well. So you've got here the financial tables and text, and it's very, very tedious to get through this. So let's imagine that you have these two documents and you want to compare them, or you want to ask uh, complex questions that you want the AI model to respond to. So for example, you might want to compare the different segments between the two companies or the two PDFs, which is basically the ability to scan through both documents and extract insights, or you might want to compare certain parts of the financial statements. Now, if you've watched my previous videos about how to chat with 1000 page PDFs, we looked at Tesla. That's a good case where you'll typically focus on one, you know, one particular document. Now let's say you try this, that approach in this case, you might run into issues. So let's jump in here. This is a naive approach, which is prone to hallucination, which is you are going to probably run into situations where the models generate outputs that you don't expect. So, um, and it's not accurate. And the reason for that is let's think about this intuitively. So this is kind of just a simplified version of my architecture in my previous videos. But in this case, the user asks a question, okay, compare the key risks between Uber and Lyft. So you want to compare the risk section in the 10K for Lyft, and then you want to uh, between Lyft and Uber. So you want the model to extract the risk section here, the risk section here and compare. Now, if alarm bells are ringing in your head in terms of why this might fail through the naive approach uh, covered in previous videos, which essentially is um, we've taken the documents, we've chopped them up into chunks, we've embedded them, we stored them in a VEX store. And in this case here, we're saying, okay, we take the query, we turn the query into embeddings. We perform similarity search in a vector DB where you store the embeddings of the original documents. And so now this is where the hallucination starts because how is the model supposed to, how is the retrieval mechanism supposed to know what exactly you're trying to pull out? It's going to be confused by the questions being the question being asked, um, because the questions being asked does not necessarily mean it's going to discriminate in terms of the relevant retrieve docs that it's then going to pass as context to the model, which is going to generate an accurate result. So if you see here, the retrieve docs in this case could have three of the four chunks. Let's say your top case four. And three of the four chunks are literally chunks from Uber. Only one chunk is coming from Lyft. Remember, there's no way that the vector DB where you stored your embeddings would have known what chunks of embeddings are representing Uber or Lyft without some potentially some advanced metadata filtering. That's a different story for a different day, right? Now you can see this is problematic because by the time you get these retrieved chunks from your documents, the context is gonna be polluted and the output is not gonna be correct. So for complex queries where you're comparing documents, we need a more advanced approach. And this is where a tool like Llama Index can come into play. Uh, so here basically, we want to be able to ask a question like compare revenue growth of Uber and Lyft from 2020 to 2021. And you can see the breakdown of the model and it's going and eventually comes out with results where it says the revenue growth of Uber from 2020 to 2021, 57%. And then revenue of Lyft was 36%. So let's jump in here. Okay, here we go. Revenue was up 57%. This is the highlight for 2021. So you can see this accurately came from the Uber doc 
And then so ultimately, it does the same ca uh, calculations over Lyft, the entire Lyft document. And here it concludes that Uber had a higher revenue between uh, than Lyft between uh, from 2020 to 2021. Uh, so how is this done? How does it work under the hood? And how can you build it for yourself? Well, I think it's probably best to hand over at this point to the founder of Llama Index, Jerry, to explain this. My name is Jerry, as uh, Mayan said, it's great to be here. I'm co-founder CEO of Llama Index. Llama Index is a framework to help you build LLM apps over your data. And we're super excited to walk through some of the core concepts today, as well as teaching you how to not just build prototype uh, rag type applications, but also uh, handle more advanced uh, questions over more complex documents. Awesome. All right, let's jump into the slides. So sharing the slides right here. Um, I figured this is a pretty quick overview and we'll bounce between both the slides and also the notebook itself. Um, but the goal of this talk is to help you understand how to build RAG, not just over uh, simple use cases where, you know, in about like five lines of code, you simple up, uh, you set up the simple stack. But you can actually iterate on the algorithm to be able to handle more advanced queries over two advanced use cases. One is over multi-document comparisons, and the other is over embedded tables and PDFs. So in the first section, we'll walk through just how the basic RAG stack works and maybe some general sense of like the, the types of like failures that you might encounter when you build this. Um, so for those of you who are already familiar with this, uh, this will be pretty uh, easy to understand. Um, but basically what the it's going on in the current retrieval augmented generation stack, and of course, Mayo has made a lot of great videos on this, is that you load in a document, right, an unstructured document, uh, from some data source. It could be a PDF, it could be an HTML file, markdown file, or it could be an API call. You load in some set of documents and then you want to use some sort of text splitting algorithm to basically split this into a bunch of chunks. Um, Llama Index basically offers a variety of toolkits around this. Uh, we have uh, toolkits to both load in data and also parse data into a bunch of chunks uh, and also tools to you know uh, take these chunks, embed them, and then put them into a vector database. Um, once the data uh, is in a vector database, then you can basically um, uh, set up some sort of retrieval augmented querying over this data, right? So you first want to retrieve uh, over the vector database by fetching the top K most similar chunks. And then you want to plug this into your LLM synthesis module to get back a response. And so if you have ever built uh, some sort of question answering or chatbot, uh, and, and this whole idea of chat with your data, like this uh, stack should be uh, pretty familiar to you. Uh, one of the nice things in Llama Index uh, as a framework is that it's kind of like tailored to help you set up stacks like this. And you can basically do the simple stack in about five lines of code. Um, these uh, sections just kind of walk through this in a little bit more detail. And so, you know, the, this really is divided into two categories. One is data ingestion and parsing. And then the second category is retrieval and querying. Um, data ingestion and parsing is really this like uh, type of ETL for your unstructured data for use with LLMs. Uh, and, and in this section, uh, as I mentioned, you want to do some sort of text splitting, generate embeddings, um, store and storing them in a vector database. Uh, once they're in a vector database, uh, you want to do some sort of um, uh, lookup to retrieve the most similar chunks given the query, and then take each chunk and then stuff it into the LLM. Um, and then uh, there's going to be maybe some complexities if like the setup chunks actually overflows the context window of the LLM. And so we have abstractions that help you deal with that within Llama Index. So now that we've walked through the basic rag stack, maybe we can kind of think about, okay, um, well, uh, th this basically breaks it down into, again, retrieval and synthesis. So dealing with like hallucination and failures, um, now that we walk through the basic RAG stack, we can kind of think about some more challenging use cases. Um, well, uh, in the next few sections, we'll go through some examples where the current RAG stack actually just cannot handle certain types of questions. And so we'll either return an incomplete answer or an answer that is incorrect. Uh, and so these specific use cases uh, involve a kind of like, um, uh, settings that are a little bit more advanced. And one of them is this idea of multi-document comparisons. Uh, how do we actually ask more complex questions over multiple documents? What the existing stack allows you to do is ask uh, questions over specific facts within a single document um, or within that's located relatively in a single location. 
And if you want to synthesize two disparate bits of information from two different documents, um, that becomes a little bit more challenging to model with the grand stack. Uh, another use case that a lot of our users have talked about and relate to is this idea of kind of having complex document objects. If you look at a single PDF, a PDF can have a lot of text, but also a lot of tables within that document. Um, it can also have a bunch of like images, charts, graphs, and those things. And so how do we properly model this data, right? Just on a data structure side. And then also how do we define the right retrieval algorithm to actually properly, you know, uh, combine like interleave uh, complex, like structured and unstructured data within a single document. And so we'll talk about both of these use cases. Um, in the first case, uh, we'll talk about this idea of multi-document comparisons. Um, and so this is a very classic example is financial analysis, uh, where let's say we want to look at the SEC 10K filings for both Uber and Lyft in 2021. Um, and let's say the question that the user wanted to ask is uh, compare and contrast right, the customer segments and geographies that grew the fastest, or compare and contrast the revenue growth of Uber and Lyft. Anytime you ask a compare and contrast query, uh, something that requires comparison across different documents, you're going to want to look into similar sections in both documents. Let's say you have both PDFs uh, and both sections have you know, a specific section on revenue or uh, customer growth. Um, and, and the issue is that when we do top K retrieval, we'll show this in the notebook in just a bit. We do top K retrieval over all the 10K chunks. It doesn't always work. Um, and so what, what's going to happen is shown in this diagram right here is like you're going to ask this question. Um, let's say you know you uh, all your 10K document chunks are stored in a single collection in the vector database. And let's say we do uh, we look at the top four most similar chunks given this question. There is no guarantee you're going to return the relevant sections from both Uber and Lyft um, you know, at the same frequency. In fact, one thing we found is that sometimes maybe all the chunks uh, will be uh, from Uber, all the chunks will be from Lyft, uh, or you're going to have some uneven balance, right? And and maybe like one section for like the, the Lyft chunk doesn't even have to deal with the, the actual um, uh, like uh, the related context at hand. Like it, it might not actually uh, give you the the kind of um, uh, revenue growth or usage uh, that actually allows you to answer this question. Um, and the reason for this is just like when you do embedding lookup, you're kind of just praying that like somehow the embedding similarity of relevant chunks matches, uh, and it's a bit less structured. So one idea that we're going to propose, and we'll walk through a notebook right now, is what if we um, can index these documents instead of just like throwing all the chunks into a single collection? What if we index the documents separately, right? So we tag Uber as like a separate collection, Lyft as like its own collection, and then given a question that is a little bit more complex, like compare revenue growth at Uber and Lyft, what if we can kind of break it down into two different questions? like describe revenue growth at Uber in 2021 and describe revenue growth at Lyft in 2021. We'll take each sub question um, and ask it over a subset of the documents in our overall collection. And so this question will go to the Uber 10K collection. This question will go to the Lyft 10K collection. And then we'll do a retrieval right within each document for the question. And then after we do retrieval within each document, then we'll combine the results at the end to actually answer the final question. So it's a bit more of like a structured query planning process. Uh, and we, we do show that this kind of gives you slightly better results than if you just tried doing the top K retrieval method. And, and great, I, I think the next step would be, uh, let's walk through a notebook of how you can actually do this within Llama Index. And while you're doing that, Jerry, um, just a quick question for someone who might be wondering how do you define what an index is? Uh, what does that mean? That's a good question. Um, so we actually do have, um, this is a great segue into maybe just some uh, overview of just like the overall uh, categories of what Lomidex has to offer. Um, if you take a look at the overall RAG pipeline, uh, which I showed in the general diagram, um, it's really kind of like a few main components. It's you want to load in your data from some data source you want to transform and parse it and load it into a data structure. Uh, and then you want, once the data is in some sort of data structure or storage system, then you want to query over it. Um, and index basically falls into this category. 
it's basically a view of your data uh, in different ways. Um, and so one example of an index, which is the most popular one, uh, is a vector index. And so I've been saying vector databases all this time. That's basically just indexing your data via embeddings so that um, when you have embeddings associated with all the data, you can look it up via top K similarity search. Uh, but you can also index your data in other ways too. For instance, if you index like the relationships between data, you can then kind of put them in a graph database. If you index them with keywords or any sort of um, structured metadata, you could put them in like a structured database as well. Right. So it's kind of like a family tree. Effectively, you've got your grandparents and so on and so forth. So you have siblings and relationships between what you call nodes, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's basically just a view of your of your data. Uh, and the overall idea here is you have some way of representing your data. And that way of representing your data is stored in some storage system. And because you represented your data in a certain way, um, then you can actually do more advanced uh, queries over it. Uh, and so in this example over here, like we show that if we represent each data a little bit separately, like we, we kind of uh, treat Uber and Lyft as like separate documents, then we can kind of do more interesting uh, query analysis over these documents by breaking questions down over each document. Right. So it's not like, you know, for someone who's not familiar with this, they might think when you're comparing two different documents, you're the AI is like scanning, <laughs> you know, one document and then scanning the other document. Uh, and then like a human being would, what you're trying to sh explain here is it's not that straightforward. It, it's almost, um, treating them separately um, as different uh, data sources initially. Yeah, um, I, I think the one of the arguments that we try to make is just um, the, if you want your AI to interact with your data uh, in the right ways, uh, you have to kind of think about carefully how you define the data that's represented for the AI. Uh, and so in this uh, existing case where you have a lot of um, like it, you have like all the 10K documents and then let's say you, you chunk and parse them and throw them into one collection. Uh, it's just a little harder for the AI to go into that and actually try to reason, you know, does this correspond to Uber? Does this go to Lyft? And then how do I compare the two together? Mm -hmm. um, and so having the right structures over your documents does help the AI better reason over how to analyze your documents. And last thing, just in terms of not jumping too far ahead, but for people who want to do this, example you know but instead of comparing customer segments they want to compare something in the financial statement right so now you're going into the territory of comparison but now you want to potentially tap into tabular content within each pdf yeah um so exactly i think tabular content is is in the next section right after this. Uh, and I think right now for just for simplicity, we can assume that um, both documents are just kind of unstructured text uh, without too many embedded tables. Uh, of course, like 10K filings have a bunch of tables in there, but we can kind of forget about that for now. Uh, but then we can, uh, the next step after this is, okay, within the document, you have a bunch of these like structured tables. Uh, and of course it's important to parse that. How do you model that properly? Yeah, yeah, just highlighting that it is possible to do that. So yeah, we can jump to the CoLab so um, for people who are not technical in simple terms, what is a Google Core Lab and what, is, <laughs> what are all these, uh, these crazy things that they're looking at right now? Yeah, so a Core Lab is just, um, it's like a Python notebook. Uh, and so uh, the nice thing is it's hosted on the web and you can share it with anybody so that anybody can just go ahead and run it. And so even if you're not technical, I think the only thing you need to do is fill in your API key uh, in the section above, which I'm not going to show because I have my own API key in there. Um, but you just have to fill that out and then run all the cells. And you basically don't really have to think about it. You can just run through all the cells. So it's a nice way of just like um, packaging a script or a demo uh, into something that's shareable. Yeah, this is just the code version of what's kind of going on under the hood. Um... Exactly. So, and if, if you're not too sure, you can always copy and paste chat GPT to help you explain what's going on. So exactly. Cool. Great. So let's walk through some, some of the basic demos. Um, I think 
this, uh, I'll probably skip the description of some of the imports and more just go through each section and, and talk about at a high level what's going on. Um, a lot of this stuff is also in the docs too. Uh, and then maybe um, I'll try to add some annotations onto this notebook and this will be shareable along with the slides. Um, and, and so we can link that in the description. So, you know, at, at the very basics, we have our own LLM abstractions. Uh, and the first thing we want to do is just like, um, you know, uh, initialize an open AI uh, uh, LLM. We're going to use 3.5 Turbo. Uh, and then we're just going to define this like overall bundle called a service context. It's just a abstraction that contain that's a container or config uh, for your LLM embedding model uh, and like chunk size and other things. So now that we have that, um, this next script just downloads the Lyft and Uber 10K from Dropbox. Uh, we, we just have that pre cache somewhere. Um, and then I think as Mayo has shown, um, we like we can go through what the Lyft and Uber 10Ks look like. Uh, and if you go into here, they're basically you know hundreds of pages long. Um, and if you're familiar with financial analysis, you're very familiar with this, but you just go through you know the business overview, uh, risk factors, like, and then a bunch of tables talking about revenue growth, costs, uh, and all these things, right? And and so, um, like, it, they're just very complex documents. And of course, like, you know, if you're a financial analyst, you're very used to kind of analyzing this yourself. Uh, and here you can see there's like a bunch of tables embedded within these documents as well. Um, so. What we're doing here is this is a very simple llama index abstraction. That's just a convenience wrapper to load in basically any file type. And so here we're just going to load in the Lyft and Uber docs. Um, I'm just oh, going to show you. Oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah. When you say loading, just to clarify, um, what what you're doing here essentially is uh, embedding the documents. Uh, oh, so. Yeah. Um, but not uh, like that. That's um, that's the next step right after this. So all we're doing here is we're just uh, running this through a PDF parser, and so I, I know right. it's taking okay. uh, it, it's uh, just finished, but this is basically um, what it looks like, and so you can see it's like um, we we extract out like a set of uh, pages. One uh, basically each document corresponds to like one page for this PDF. And then right. if we just print the content of this, you can see it's just a dump of plain text. Um, and so there's a bunch of different PDF parsers you can try out. Um, we have about like 10 or so um, on mm -hmm. our Llama Hub website, which is our source of data loaders that you can try out. Um, and so this is just using PyPDF. There's also like PyMu PDF. We integrate with unstructured.io, they're great. Um, we have like uh, deep doc detection uh, and a few others as well. Cool. So now that we loaded in the data, um, the next step is to index this data and store it. Um, and so Mayo, this is exactly what you talked about where, um, you know, as a convenience, uh, we're just gonna, we can actually just do this in one line of code. And so you just see vector store index from documents with the set of documents that you feed in. Um, and the idea here is really to set up that baseline uh, rag stack, uh, like what I just described. And so what this is going to do is under the hood, as it's running this, it's going to chunk stuff up. Um, it's going to embed each chunk, and then it's going to put it into a simple in-memory vector store. Mm -hmm. So for those who haven't watched my previous videos, uh, embedding is essentially is you, you're transforming your text into numbers. Um, and these numbers is things that the computer can understand and run computations on, including uh, finding similar parts of your document uh, related to the question you ask it. Exactly. Um, and then once we actually index this, what we're going to do is we're going to get this thing called a query engine from the index. Uh, and what this query engine gives you is um, it's essentially an interface to query the data that's now stored within your uh, vector index. Uh, and so this query engine just is an interface to you, for you to start to ask questions. And then when you ask questions, like we're going to go through some of these questions uh, over here, we're basically going through that second step in that RAG architecture that we talked about, which is this piece. Like we're going to do retrieval from your vector DB, retrieve a bunch of chunks, and then we're going to take those chunks and then actually feed it into an outlook. Uh -huh. 
Uh, for the sake of this tutorial, I'm kind of abstracting all of this into a single line of code. Uh, and so there's a bit of uh, you know magic going on under there. Uh, well, it's not really magic. It's just really these two steps. Um, a quick plug for, we, we, we did, if you want to really understand how these things uh, uh, work under the hood, uh, we did come out with like a lower level set of tutorials on retrieval and synthesis uh, to basically help you encourage how to build like rag from scratch. So not using these like high level abstractions, but more of the low level abstractions. So you can learn for yourself how that works. Um, now that we have this base engine, now we can start asking questions over it. Um, and the idea is, is to show, you know, the capabilities of what the baseline model can do. And so we can ask, like, you know, we have both Lyft and Uber doc chunks in there. We can ask questions like, oh, what are some of the risk factors for Uber? Uh, we set the top K equals to four, equal to four. And so this means that we're kind of retrieving the top four chunks uh, every given point. Here, you can see that we get back a response, like some risk factors include, you know, violent, inappropriate, dangerous activity, those things. Uh, and then really quick, you can actually go in and take a look at sources. Um, yeah, very important, actually, that you point that out because uh, people will want to know where exactly it's coming from in the document. 100%. So you can see here, um, I'm just going to fetch, uh, show you, like, here's a number of source notes. Um, you can see there's four source notes. And this is just an example of the first source that the document comes from, or the, the answer comes from. And so this is just an example chunk within the document. And just, just to prove, <laughs> maybe you want to jump back to the document and just prove that this came from the document for those first, who... Um, let's see, I think I'm going to just drivers, consumers, merchants. Yeah, control F. I think it's here. Yeah. Oh, nope. I'm just going to copy more of this. <laughs> it's right here. So we're not able to control or predict the actions of platform users and third parties, either during the use of platform. And so here it's basically, um, this is in the, if I'm not, uh, mistaken in, in the risk factor section. Yeah. Amazing. Good stuff. Yep. So, okay. Now we have this vector index. Now let's ask a compare and contrast question. Okay. Let's compare and contrast the risk factors of Uber and Lyft. And then we're going to run this. Um, and I think I might've already uh, <laughs> betrayed what the results are going to look like, but it basically says, I'm sorry, but I cannot provide a direct comparison and contrast of the risk factors. Okay, so we asked, why Why is that? Um, when you kind of go into some of the sources, you see that, you know, like the in the first step, like you, you do see Lyft like 2021, right? Um, and, and you see a page label. This is like the first source. When you go to the second source, um, you also continue to see Lyft, right? And then let's go to a third source. It's still Lyft. Um, and then you go to the fourth source and it's still left. So, so <laughs> like you, 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 basically, <laughs> you basically just like dumped everything into the single collection and you just like fetched a bunch of random chunks. And, and of course, like, just like, you know, even with the metadata, right. Saying that this is from left, like you're, you're just not able to figure out a correct answer for this. So this motivates a little bit more of like a structured approach. So this is a nice segue into the sub question query engine um, where, you know, this query engine uh, will basically do the following and, and we'll show you how to set this up. First, we're going to treat different documents as um, we're actually just going to index them differently. Uh, you can do this in a variety of ways. Uh, you could, you know, technically they could be in the same collection and in, for instance, a vector database like uh, Pinecone or Weavia or Chroma, uh, but they could just be in a different namespace. But uh, regardless, we're just going to treat them as like slightly different tools. So we're going to have a Lyft index and an Uber index. So, yeah, as you're kind of loading all of this, um, for the more technical viewer, um, I guess they're kind of wondering, does all these different VEX tools have different um, terminologies? You've got namespaces with Pinecone, collections with Chroma. Um, mm -hmm. and so I guess off the top of their head, they're probably wondering, are all the embeddings going into the same uh, namespace, for example, 
or the same collection or do you have to basically construct your code to embed them separately into different um different collections or namespaces so that's a really good question i think that's one of the nice things about our abstractions which is that you um the index is basically just a view over the storage system and we integrate with all these storage systems and so it, it, the short answer is you, it could basically be whatever you want it to be um, so you could have them like each of these be a separate collection uh or you know if you're using pinecone they could each be uh under different namespaces um or uh they could actually just be like different metadata filters uh in the same in the same table cool. um, and so we, we don't really show how you can figure that here but you could you can do that yeah. um great so now we have uh uber and lyft index um and the next step is we're just gonna similar to before uh, get back a query engine for both Uber and Lyft. Um, and now we have separate query engines for Lyft and Uber, right? And we see the similarity top k is equal to two. And so now, you know, if we ask questions here, it's going to be about Lyft. And if we ask questions here, it's going to be about Uber. The next step here is th this starts to, um, uh, as an overall concept, um, get into like, a little bit of like agentic reasoning, um, basically using LLMs, not just for the final synthesis step in RAG, but actually helping with a little bit of automated decision making. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to define each of Lyft and Uber as tools, right? And the tool is going to have like a name and also description. So here, the Lyft tool is going to say, uh, provides information for Lyft financials for year 2021. And here, the Uber uh, tool is going to say, provides information about Uber financials for the year 2021. Mm -hmm. So we're going to define these tools and give it to this high-level query engine, which you know is basically like a mini agent, um, and 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 kind of, but it's it's like not really the full like React agent if you're familiar with that, uh, or just like any sort of full agent loop. Um, but the idea here is we're actually going to rely on some sort of automated decision-making process by providing this tool metadata up to this like overall query engine that can make decisions. And so by providing these as tools with names and descriptions, we can basically start implementing this approach right here, right? Like given this top level question, uh, you can actually figure out how to break it into sub questions that correspond to specific uh, subsets of these tools to ask over. And here we see that we initialize our sub question query engine. So now that we initialize it, um, let's run some example queries. Um, one example here is how do we uh, compare and contrast the risk factors of uh, Uber and Lyft, basically the same question as before. And you can see it's basically actually just doing what, what I said, like you have this overall question uh, and it's breaking it down into two different sub questions. And uh, what are the risk factors for Uber? What are the risk factors for Lyft? And you're able to ask that over each document actually. And now you see you have like these two different answers, like Lyft and Uber. And then you actually get back a final answer um, that is coherent. And so it says the risk factors for both Uber and Lyft include potential criminal, violent, inappropriate, or dangerous activity by platform users, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So unlike the previous example where it couldn't answer, like, you know, here, here we are giving uh, some sort of answer. Here's another example. Um, let's just say, like, tell me what was higher, Uber's revenue growth or Lyft's revenue growth. And using the text, uh, explain the reasons for, for the revenue growth. And here we just run it across both the base query engine as well as the sub question query engine. Um, and so I think I just finished running over here. And here is just going to break it down over uh, some sort of uh, the sub questions. You can see the sub questions generated is like, what was Uber's revenue growth? What was Lyft's revenue growth? What are the factors that contributed to Uber's revenue growth uh, to Lyft's revenue growth? And then you're getting back answers to all of these, right? Because you're breaking it down into some sort of query plan. And then you're actually able to get back an answer. So now let's actually compare the responses. Okay. I mean, <laughs> So it, in this setting, um, I think, it, you know, it's kind of interesting is I think the answer actually um, 
uh, like changes a little bit. I, I, this is the example from the, the base uh, query engine, which actually does give you a response. It says like Uber's revenue growth is higher than less revenue growth. Um, the text explains that, you know, uh, Uber's revenue growth is shown by factors uh, and Lyft's revenue growth depends on this. Uh, and and the, the sub question query uh, engine, of course, like gives you back a similar response as well. Um, I think the, the, the catch is like, I think there's a little bit of like stochasticity in here too, because like, I think when you take a look at the base response, like sources um, in the previous answer, it actually said like, I couldn't give uh, context. I, I basically, like I said, um, I didn't have enough context to talk about the reasons for Lyft's revenue growth, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can try to inspect some of the sources uh, of the base response uh, to see see why. So here we see that that's Uber. Um, this is Lyft. And then this is Uber. And this is also Uber. Uh, and so actually you got like right. three Uber results and, and one Lyft. And, and actually sometimes we found that when you, when you do this, the language model gets like confused half the time. And so in, in this case, it actually was, was right. But uh, because like the sources are imbalanced, you actually see that sometimes like the, the answer isn't, isn't fully correct. Mm -hmm. But what happened obviously different to the previous case was that it was able to go and deal with each document separately. And then the comparison. Now, for the more technical person here asking the question of how is this different from using a um, uh, like a function calling kind of strategy, um, for those who don't understand what I'm saying, it's just a way um, that OpenAI is basically fine tune their uh, models to allow you to mm -hmm. allow the model to basically. Um, extract um, specific information from um, the query and use that to do other things um, because your query engine structure uh, with the description mm -hmm. looked similar to a function call. I think at a high level, um, so this is a great question. Um, at a high level, like this starts to get into agentic behavior um, and uh, like th this is worth like a longer discussion on kind of like the whole spectrum between something with zero automated reasoning and something with full automated reasoning. So the thing about OpenAI function calls is that um, there's a few concrete differences with this. One is that here, like all the query plans are generated in parallel. Uh, and so it's really designed for this case of like multi-document comparisons, being able to look at everything independently. Uh, whereas a function call, uh, by, by default, I think it relies on some sort of sequential loop. And so it's going to be a bit slower. Um, but of course, like a function call can take in this complex question, do some sort of train of thought prompting, and then actually break it down. Mm -hmm. I think in general, we've noticed that the more flexible the agent loop is, once you go to the right of the spectrum to function calling React loops, um, the technically the more flexible it is, but also the more prone it is to failures. Uh, one thing we found with weaker models like 3.5 Turbo on function calling is that when we ask like complex questions like this, it starts, a lot of times it starts giving like, um, uh, it starts just like uh, iterating on these calls, even when it shouldn't, uh, right? And and so it starts getting into loops basically. Uh, and for some reason, it's just like a little bit less reliable. Um, so that's one. The other piece here is like, you know, regardless of whether you're using query planning or some sort of train of thought reasoning, um, I think one of the points here is that one of the nice things, um, uh, that we do is basically mapping each sub question to the specific subset of data that it corresponds to. So here, I'll like describe revenue growth at Uber in 2021, it maps it to Uber's 10K and asks it specifically over this document. And so the idea is that if you want to build this yourself too, you definitely can. Um, I would recommend like the part of the goal I'm trying to like teach is like you should try to um, not just like do chain of thought over your data or break it break it down break down the questions. You should also try to select the relevant set of data that this question corresponds to. Um, and that helps to increase reliability uh, because sometimes like when you break it down into these sub questions and you ask it over the whole data, you might again, get back like a hodgepodge of information from like different sources. And you might not actually be able to um, synthesize the right answer or it might hallucinate given the, the set of sources. Mm -hmm. So this is just like a structured approach to 
given a question, break it down and also restrict it to the subsets of data that corresponds to, to give you back an answer. Cool. And what would you say is the, um, the downside, potential downside of the strategy? Yeah, um, some like basic downsides is kind of depends like what spectrum you want to uh, look at it at. Um, one is if you care a lot about latency and costs, uh, this does increase your costs uh, and does increase your latency a little bit because we're breaking it down into questions. Um, we do asyncify all of these. So all of these things are getting asked in parallel. Um, and, but there is like kind of two extra LM calls, right? We're first breaking it down uh, and then we're answering each question and then we're synthesizing everything at the end. Um, yeah. The other piece here is it's, I mean, this is kind of, des this is designed for multi-document comparisons. So you're not gonna get like AGI from this from this engine. Like it's not just gonna be able to solve like arbitrary tasks, like find me like how to deal with like world peace or something. Uh, this is very oriented mm -hmm. towards like uh, comparisons of for like financial analysis or, or other settings. Right, right. So, but yeah, I mean, this can work for other types of documents, um, other PDFs. Um, mm -hmm people have they want to compare and i guess it can work with three or two or more documents as well yes um this is just two documents we have an example with three you can do an arbitrary number yeah cool awesome so i think that was a pretty good recap of how to effectively compare and contrast um documents uh which is a, co a complex approach um especially if you want to do that for um large you know, documents like annual reports, you got other policy documents, even legal documents as well. Um, Jerry, anything else you want to say to to wrap off, wrap this up? No, I think um, the one thing I'll say is um, like, this is obviously just uh, some basic qualitative benchmarks. Uh, and so for the sake of just like kind of articulating what the development process of this should be, um, I think there are a few things that, um, uh, you should definitely keep in mind. One is being able to define some sort of evaluation benchmark uh, and, and being able to define like actually, okay, here's like my data and here's actually the candidate set of questions I want to ask over my data. And if some of it actually includes comparison queries, let's actually benchmark it, right? Like before you even do use the sub question query engine, let's just use the um, basic stuff, uh, define a set of questions and define some metrics to measure it over. And it's only like, you know, when that metric doesn't actually meet your quality bar that you should try iterating on some of these more advanced techniques like the sub question query engine. And so that's one thing that we didn't get to because we mostly looked at qualitative examples, but it is quite important. So I, I do want to kind of point that out. Awesome. All right. So we're going to have the links to this uh, in the description alongside information about Llama Index and more. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Thank you.